If you would, get your Bibles open and ready to Galatians chapter 2. I think finally <laughs> we're going to finish this chapter, um, unless I go off on another detour today, but uh, it's not my plan. could be God's, but it's not mine. Galatians chapter 2, we're going to finish this chapter, as I said, but a couple things we're going to be looking at today, I think, are real powerful topics for the Christian church, for all of us as believers. We're going to be looking at so many Christians still base their relationship with God in a form of legalism, performance-based relationship, where you think you're going to earn God's favor or even salvation by your works and by all the things you do. And a performance-based relationship with God will, is just unfulfilling and it's hard. It's really hard for people who have that understanding and don't understand what grace is to have the joy of the Lord in their lives. And then secondly, we're going to look at the danger, not just of non-believers straddling the fence of religion, but as Christians, we should never straddle the fence either, being halfway in the world and halfway with Jesus. It's, it's destructive in our life, you know, and, and it hurts us and those around us. So we're going to be looking at that today. So Galatians chapter 2, as you know, what's going on here is Paul has written this letter to the churches of Galatia, which is that region in central Turkey, modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, in the region of Galatia. He wrote them this letter to tell them because he had warned them he, they had gotten off track because Judaizers had come in, and Judaizers were these Christian men who were Jews first. They believed to be saved, you had to be a Jew first. For men, you had to be circumcised. And then every person had to live under the law and be a Jew first before they could be saved by Jesus. And it was a false gospel. And they had embraced it in Galatia, and Paul has been writing against it. And he's been telling them, he's building his case, and he's saying, get back on track. He loves them enough to get them back on track. And he tells them, we saw this in chapter 1, if anyone brings a different gospel, even if it's an angel from heaven, an angel of light, even if that angel brings you a different gospel, let them be accursed. Because there is only one gospel. And there's only one, gospel means good news. There's only one gospel that's truly a gospel, that's truly good news. And that's saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by Christ alone. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But these men had lied about Paul. They had come against Paul. They had come against his gospel. And we know Paul had defended himself. And he, he came to the, to the place in this letter where he's explaining to them. He went up to Jerusalem not just three years after his conversion, but then 14 years after his conversion. And both times, nobody ever taught him anything different or told him his gospel was different than theirs. These men in Jerusalem. We talked about it, you know, Peter, uh, James, and John, the second time he, got, he came before them, and they agreed with the gospel that he'd been preaching to the Gentiles. It's the same gospel Peter was preaching to the Jews. And he even told them he brought Titus with him, a well-respected Gentile believer. He brought him to Jerusalem with him, and what? They didn't compel him to be circumcised, to live under the law. And so he's explaining to them, this is the true gospel that I'm telling you. It's a false gospel these Judaizers are bringing in. But he told, he told us in that, last week we looked at this, and I, I rested on that word pillar for a while. But Paul explained that Peter, James, and John, they seem to be pillars. Pillars, and it just means this. To be a pillar in the church of God, we know that the, the church itself is called a pillar because it's the truth of Christ. It's the truth of the gospel. It stands for the truth in this world. And I told you that's why it breaks my heart that so many pastors and teachers and others are getting off track and teaching things that aren't from Scripture. But he called, he, you know, in, a, in that I called us to be pillars. Because to be a pillar means to stand for the truth of Christ, to stand for the word of God. It means something in these days. And we're going to stand on the word of God here, and we're going to stand for the word, and we are not going to deviate. Uh, if we do, let God correct me. <laughs> let God correct all of us. We are to be pillars in this world. They, this world needs us to stand for the truth. They don't even realize, they don't even know that it's the church that's protecting them from destruction. They don't even realize that the moment we're gone from this planet, then God will start to pour out his wrath. They don't realize we're the very thing protecting them. And we need to stand for truth and be pillars. And that's what Paul, you know, is alluding to. But also, I want us, I want to challenge us again to be pillars in this world. Be pillars of truth, of Christ's truth. Stand tall. For some of us, that's kind of hard. But, you know, it's like, just stand for truth. Don't waver. Don't lean. Don't crumble. Stand for truth. And now we're going to read, Paul is, is explaining all of this, and then he's going to show them, he's going to say, look, I even had to correct one of these pillars. I even had to come against one of these pillars. He's going to explain that later, after this, this incident in Jerusalem, when he went up there and they confirmed his gospel, he had to correct Peter the pillar. When Peter came and visited Antioch, 
Paul is going to have to confront him face to face, and he's going to tell the Galatians about this. He's going to write this in his letter. He's going to say, look, I had to confront Peter himself, a guy who knew better. I had to confront him for his hypocrisy, for being a hypocrite, for promoting legalism. That's what he was doing. And he, Peter had caved to pressure around him, and that's what we're going to see as we look at this. And Peter began to slip into legalism itself. Now, when I say legalism, in this context, what we're talking about is that world, man's-based, performance-based relationship with God, where if anything is put in front of the gospel, it's a false gospel. And Peter was promoting this, and he's going to get rebuked. He was promoting being a Jew first. And so that's what we're going to see. So Paul explains this in Galatians chapter 2. Verses 11 through 13, I'll read the text and then we'll dive in. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him face, or to his face because he was to be blamed. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Let's pray. Father God, this is your word, and we know your word will not return void. And Lord, right now, we invite you into our hearts and our minds. We invite your word into us, Lord. We know that it gets inside of us. It changes us. This is no ordinary book. This is your living word. And so, God, pour out your spirit upon us. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your truth. Help me to get out of the way, Lord, and let your word do what your word does. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I just have to admit something. <laughs> you know, a lot of times this is a therapy session for me, so I get things off my chest. Now, when I came back to the Lord, you know, I backslid as a teenager. Many of us do, and it's become cliche <laughs> in this country. But I did, and I came back to the Lord in my early 20s. Now, I did something similar to this, kind of opposite but similar, you'll see, as I try to explain. But when I came back to the Lord, I didn't just get rid of all my worldly friends. That's pretty much all I had. But I started, I had a few Christian friends, and it was crazy because when I'd get around my worldly friends, now they knew I was different because I wasn't cussing, I wasn't doing all these things that they were doing, you know. They knew I was different, but I never talked about the Lord. I never talked about the Lord. I just kind of kept it to myself, my faith to myself, and I didn't stir, you know, or rock the boat. I just went along with it. With my Christian friends, oh man, I was on fire for the Lord. We'd talk about Jesus. We'd talk about prophecy. We'd talk about the Bible. I'd pray before meals, you know, we'd go out to eat. Oh man, it was great. Then the two worlds collided. <laughs> and my Christian friend, he invited me to lunch and my other two friends were like, hey, can we go? I was like, oh, okay. So we go to lunch and <laughs> my Christian buddy, he, he saw, he was, he was from China and he was a strong Christian. Let me tell you, there's some strong Christians in China, strong and uh, he, he kind of knew what was going on. He says, hey, Marty, do you want to pray for the meal? <laughs> I was like, you jerk. Um, and so I was like, well, okay. So I pray for the meal. My other two buddies are kind of looking at me like, that's kind of weird. You know, you don't normally do that. Um, but my buddy knew, my Christian friend knew. He knew I was being a hypocrite. And he even talked to me afterwards. He's, he got a kick out of it. <laughs> you know, he was like, yeah, I saw you squirming. It was great. Uh, whatever. <laughs> Go back to China, missionary. <laughs> Honestly, though, this is, this is the powerful thing. That man, let me tell you, it's one of the strongest Christian men I ever met. He was a young man, too, in his 20s. And uh, he did exactly that. And uh, to this day, he's serving the Lord. It's pretty awesome. But here's the thing. As a Christian, you know, we can't be half in the world and half in the church. You can't. It doesn't work that way. It'll make you miserable. It'll make everyone else around you miserable. But it's worse for the non-believer. Because a lot of times, non-believers who, who, who soak their conscience in religion, who go to church, but they're never really born again, they're halfway in the church, but they're halfway in the world. But really, let me, let me share with you a story. Recently, somebody shared a story with me. So I went on the internet and found it. It's written by Anonymous, whoever Anonymous is. So um, I want to read you this story, but I thought it was powerful, this point. It says, there was a large group of people gathered. On one side of the group was Jesus. On the other side stood Satan. Separating them was a fence running through the group. The scene set, both Jesus and Satan began calling people to their group. And one by one, each having made up his or her own mind, went to the either side, either Jesus or Satan. This kept going on for some time. Soon enough, Jesus had gathered an, uh, around him a group of people from the larger crowd, and so did Satan. One man didn't join either group. He climbed on the fence, and he was there, and he just sat there. Jesus and his group and the people then left and disappeared, and so did Satan and his group and the people. 
The man sat on the fence there alone, and as he sat there, Satan came back, appearing to be looking for something which he had lost. The man said, have you lost something? Satan looked straight at him and said, no, there you are. Come with me. The man said, but I sat on the fence. I chose neither you nor him. And Satan said, that's okay, because I own the fence. And this is the thing. You know, that is so true. It is so true. There is no fence to straddle because it belongs to the enemy. It's enemy territory. Do you understand? It's enemy territory. Jesus said this himself in Matthew 12, verse 30. He said, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. And I, I remember hearing Greg Laurie's testimony, Pastor Greg Laurie, Harvest and all of that. He said that the thing that really got him as he was listening to, I think it was Lonnie Frisbee or somebody preaching on the campus of his high school. He said, you're either for Jesus or you're against him. There's no in between. And he thought, well, wait a second. I don't want to be against Jesus. It's a powerful thing when you think about it. But even last week, I talked about that church, the last day's church, the apostate church, found in that letter to the church of Laodicea. Well, Jesus told them this. In Revelation 3, 15 and 16, he said this. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That, to me, is one of the most scary, heartbreaking statements I've ever heard. These people thought they were Christians. They were doing all these works. Remember, many in that day will come to me and say, Lord, we did all these works. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You see, there's no middle ground. And, of course, I'm talking about those who are not believers. You can't straddle the fence with religion, appeasing your conscience, and still think you're going to heaven. You're not saved by your own works. In fact, it condemns you. So if you're not for Jesus, you're de by default against Jesus. You don't want to make Jesus your enemy. You're al he's already, here's the thing, we were at enmity with God. This is what the gospel is all about. We were the enemies of God before Christ paid for our sins, before he took all of that upon himself. And so, you know, as Christians, we can't straddle the fence either. Non-believers for sure, but as Christians either, because what does it do? It damages our testimony. We have no witness to those around us. People will know we're being hypocritical. And not only that, it hurts the Lord because it hurts our relationship with him. And that's the thing I want us to grasp today is the Lord says, draw close to him, he'll draw close to you. He wants relationship with you based in grace, not in your works. You can't do anything to impress him. It's like, remember when your, your kids were little, maybe some of you have little kids where they would draw you this picture when they're like three years old. Hey, this is you, daddy. And it looks like a cow with, you know, missing one leg or something. You're like, oh, wow. Oh. But you put it on that fridge because you're so proud of your son, your daughter. You know, it's like you're just happy at the works they could do. Do you realize that's us in relationship to God? We can't do anything that impresses him except love him. Build that relationship with him. But here, Peter is, is dealing with hypocrisy. He's trying to straddle the fence. He's avoiding his Gentile brothers and sisters to be with the Jewish people. And he's acting like a Jew under the law first and condemning the Gentiles by doing so. It tells us that certain men who came from James, remember James, the half-brother of Jesus, was the leader. He was the pastor of the Jerusalem church. He was in charge of the Jerusalem church. And these men had come from him. Of course, the Jerusalem influence, Judaism and all this. And now Peter is acting like a Jew. And now Paul's calling him out. Now this is what happens too. It usually impacts everyone around us when we act like this. And we will draw people. Peter's a leader in the church. And we're going to see others follow his lead. But you know what? It's the same for each of us as parents, as friends, as whoever. You know, when we do things like this, people will follow our lead. But look at this, Galatians 2, 11 through 13 again. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, Paul says, I withstood him to his face. That's a bold statement. That's saying, I had to do this because he was to be blamed. He was at fault for before certain men came from James, that is from Jerusalem, he would eat with the Gentiles. Oh, Peter. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself. Now, look at this, fearing those who were of the circumcision. Religion can cause fear. Religion and legalism, it causes people to cower. It causes people to fear because they don't want to be seen as that one not doing the right thing. And for any who try to argue that Peter was the first pope, and he was afraid of these men from Jerusalem. He didn't rule the roost. Do you understand? It's like he was still a human being, and he feared religion. He feared what they would say about him back in Jerusalem. 
Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, with Peter, so that even Barnabas, Paul's best friend, the man who came alongside Paul, his name means son of encouragement, even Barnabas, my best friend, Paul saying, was carried away with their hypocrisy. And this is the thing, again, make it personal. Mom, dad, husband, wife, when you go astray, when you do things, people will follow you. Your kids will follow you. Those around you will follow you when you compromise. And so here we see this leader who should be a pillar in the church, who seemed to be a pillar, Peter the apostle leading others astray. And the thing about Peter is this. If you know Peter's story, he is the one man on the planet that should have known better. He is the one person who should have known better. Peter came there to Antioch to visit Paul and the church, but Peter is the man who should have known better. Remember the story of Cornelius, the first Gentile believer in Scripture to be saved? Peter was sent to him. Remember the story? I just want us to be reminded of this. In Acts chapter 10, it was Peter who was called to that first Gentile believer. Scripture says this of Cornelius. He was a Roman centurion of the Italian regiment, but it calls him a devout man. And he was praying all the time. And one time when he was praying, God sends an angel. Look at this, Acts 10, 3 through 8. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up before a memorial before God. Ah, just think about that. Your prayers, do your prayers come up before God as a memorial? Does God hear your prayers? You bet he does. Verse 5, now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. God sends an angel to speak to this Gentile. He says, hey, I got something cool for you. (laughs) I'm paraphrasing this. But how amazing is that? God saw the heart of this man and he says, you know what? I choose him as the first one. I choose him as the first Gentile. I love that. By the way, he's a soldier. You know, I won't get into the politics of that, but it's pretty amazing. And he's a leader. And so we know that God's working in all this. And then he prepares Peter in the same way. Because remember, Peter is still at this point, the church is still at this point Jewish. And they didn't believe the Gentiles were saved. And they didn't eat with the Gentiles. They didn't go into Gentile houses. All of this was still in the church until this. Acts 10, verse 9 through 16. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. You ever done that when you get really hungry, fall into a trance? I don't know. It happens to me. Verse 11. And saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. (laughs) No, Lord. Remember I talked about this? It's an oxymoron. You can't say no, Lord. If he's your Lord, you can't say no. (laughs) You understand? Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Remember I told you when God speaks to us once in Scripture or something, when he speaks to us twice, listen. But when he speaks to you three times, really listen. He's saying, really, really, really listen. He's telling Peter this lesson. Peter's a little hard, you know, he's got a hard head like some of us. And he's telling him three times. He's giving him this lesson. After this, Peter then went to meet with Cornelius because he knew what the Lord was saying. He understood that God was telling him that it was okay to go to that Gentile's house because before this, they wouldn't even go to a Gentile house. And in Acts 10, 28, he said this to them. Peter says this to Cornelius after they meet. Uh, Verse 28, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. That's talking about the Gentiles. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And then he preaches to the whole house of Cornelius, and he tells them this in Acts 10, 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whomever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And so no one, no one 
knew the lesson more than Peter. He knew that God showed no partiality, that every nation, including Gentiles, were included in the gospel. He knew under the new covenant that nothing was unclean. He was being a hypocrite. Aren't you glad you're never a hypocrite? I'm so glad uh, we're here in our holy church and everybody. It's so wonderful to come to church and there's no hypocrites here. It's, I love you guys. You just, here's the thing. You know when people say, I don't go to church, there's too many hypocrites. And we always say what? There's room for one more. <laughs> you know, Peter was a hypocrite at times. We are hypocrites at times. It happens when we fall back into our old ways, into our flesh, into things we ought to know better. Peter should have known better. The Lord clearly told Peter, Gentiles can be saved. There is nothing unclean in the new covenant. But Peter was being led by the flesh and not by the spirit. And Paul's having none of his hypocrisy. Look at verses 14 through 16 in Galatians 2. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, he's telling them in front of everybody, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Good question. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Paul is bold. Don't you want to be that bold? <laughs> I mean, it'll get you beat. It'll get you stoned to death, things like that. But, yeah. But I just want to recognize something. Paul's being bold for a reason. Peter's a guest in Antioch. When Paul's talking about this whole experience, Peter had come to Antioch. Understand, this was Paul's home church. Paul had been pastor to this church for a number of years. These were his people. And let me tell you, if somebody comes into this church preaching a new gospel, uh, bringing people, raising people up in legalism and doing those things, I'm going to stand against it. I'm going to come against it. I have every right. So do the other pastors and leaders in this church. This was Paul's church. He didn't go to Jerusalem and start telling the Jerusalem church what they were supposed to do. I'm not going to go down the street and, and tell some church what to do. But if they come into our church, they came into Paul's church, even Peter teaching a different gospel, raising up legalism, drawing people unto himself, we have to stand against it. And that's what Paul is doing. He's being bold. That's what Paul's doing right here. Even if it is the pillar known as Peter, even if it's Peter, he's protecting the flock, but he's also lovingly correcting his brother in Christ. And this is the thing I want to mention. It doesn't matter what position in the church. It doesn't matter if it's the pastor, the elders, the deacon, you know, anybody who serves in the church or just everybody who comes to the church. When we get off track, we need people in our lives. We need people to come alongside of us and say, let me straighten your pillar up. Let me get you back on track. You're crumbling a little over here. Let me shore up your foundation. You're getting off track. I need it. You need it. We need it. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's why humility is such a key in the Christian life. When you're wrong, just admit it. Just admit you're wrong. So much good comes out of just admitting when you're wrong and getting back on track. And that's what's going on here. He tells Peter in verse 14, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? What he's basically saying is, you know, Peter, before these men from Jerusalem came, you were eating a ham sandwich. You were over there at the all-you-can-eat shrimp buffet. You were popping lobster. I saw you. Don't tell me. And then all of a sudden when they show up, what happens? You're Rabbi Cephas, you know? Think about it. He's, he's calling him out for his hypocrisy. Before these men showed up, you had no problem fellowshipping with the Gentiles. You had no problem eating at their table. You ate their food. You ate with them. And now these men show up. It's like, you know, you, they invite, you know, these men to lunch and you're going to act different. You're going to be different. You're going to separate yourself. This is what he's saying. He's saying, Peter, you ought to know better. Verse 15 and 16 again. We who are Jews by nature, that means born as Jewish people, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. If you, a Jew born as a Jew, under the law, if you've discarded the Jewish customs and all the regulations of the law, how is it, Peter, that you're now trying to make the Gentiles live like you? Telling them they're less than you. 
And Peter and them might have argued against it. I love what Pastor David Guzik wrote in his commentary. Perhaps Peter and the others might say, we're not making them live as Jews, but of course they were. Because their message was, unless you live as Jews, you aren't saved. This did, in fact, compel Gentiles to live as Jews. Paul states, hey, you know what? We're not justified by the law. The law can't justify any of us. And this, this is the thing. He's telling them they're justified by Christ alone, and I love this word, justified. You've probably heard that before, just as if I'd never sinned, justified. That's what it literally means. This word in the Greek is a powerful word because it's declaring in this context that you're justified before God on judgment day. You're justified through Christ, not by your own works, just as if I'd never sinned. Can you imagine? I told you that story of that guy's dream where he's standing in front of the Lord and he's crying and he's, he's just, he, he sees the Lord and he's never felt such love. And all he can think is, Lord, I'm so sorry for my sin. And the Lord said to him, what sin? You know, think about that. When you and I stand before the Lord, justified, just as if I'd never sinned. Just as if I never said that stupid thing. <laughs> just as if I never hurt those people. Just as if I'd never done that. Just as if all of my sin, all of your sin is forgiven and forgotten. <laughs> Justified. What a powerful word. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. It's impossible to be justified by the law. We can't keep half the law, let alone all the law. It's impossible. We love the law, we respect the law, because that's what it was brought for. It was to show us we can't do it. We can't keep the law. We can't be good enough. We're hopeless without God. That's why he reached down from heaven. That's why he became a man and walked among us. Because we couldn't do it. He fulfilled the law because we're failures. And he knew that about us. And he justified us through the blood of Christ. I think Paul, you know, he's adding all of this information about Peter in this letter just to remind this group in Galatia, to remind them how important it is to stay on track and how easy it is to become legalistic, that it can happen to anybody, even leaders in the church. It's easy to start being hypocritical and go along with the crowd. It's so easy. I think all of us know this. You know, I've seen it so many times in my own life where all of a sudden I get off track a little bit because of some person or some relationship I have in the church or some, you know, um, friend or whatever. And then we start talking about the scripture and then, you know, they bring up these things. And then after a while, I start believing what they're saying. It's happened to all of us in our Christian walk. Be careful. Test all things. Help each other. Stay on track. And then Paul is going to add these powerful words. And this right here, I'll tell you, if you can grasp this section of scripture, you can really grasp this it will change your Christian life radically. I don't say that lightly. Look at this, Galatians 2, 17 through 21. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. You know the thing about cults and other religions and all this, you know, that add things to the gospel? What they're really saying is the cross doesn't mean what it really means. What they're saying is the cross isn't enough. If it's Jesus plus all these other rules and regulations, these other books, these other things, then what they're really saying is the cross, doesn't, the cross isn't sufficient. The cross isn't enough. Could you imagine saying that to the Lord? Oh, I know what you did, Lord, but it's not enough. I got to fill in the gap with this special work I got to do, with this other book I got to read. What an insult to the king of kings. The one who came and walked among us, Emmanuel, lived a perfect life and went to that cross for every one of us, took all of our sins upon himself, endured all of that for us, and then to say, well, that's not enough. I got to add some things to it. That's heartbreaking. But if you can grasp what's being said in this passage, I promise you it'll change you radically. Because this is one of the hardest things for Christians to grasp 
is the grace of God and what it really means. Now, let me set the stage again. So what's going on? Paul's explaining in this letter to the Galatians about this experience in Antioch. And he's telling them, this is what's going on. On one side, you had all these Jewish people, all of these so-called Christian men who are holding to legalism. They have a kosher table. They're over here on their own table having their religious feast. And over here on the other side, the kids' table. <laughs> Remember that at Thanksgiving when you were a kid? The kids' table, you got all the Gentiles. We don't know that they're really saved. Probably they're not because they're not Jews. They haven't been circumcised. They're not kosher. We're going to separate ourselves from them. How heartbreaking is that? And Paul is standing up in the midst of this. In the midst of this dinner, he's standing in between these two groups proclaiming this. Paul knows the problem, and he's bold enough to take a stand. He gets up, and he tells them. Essentially, Paul's going to lay out an argument, and then he's going to give them an answer to any objection they might have in verse 17 when he says, But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. What he's asking Peter is this. He's asking Peter and all of those who are with him. He says, If we eat with the Gentiles... Because we were, Peter, you and I were eating with the Gentiles before these men arrived. If we're eating with the Gentiles, and you're correct in your assessment of separation, then myself and you, Peter, we've fallen backwards. We've become sinners again. Do you understand, Peter? We were eating with them before they got here. I just want to challenge each one of us, too. Because, you know, here's the other thing. In these days, we want to reach our friends and family. We want to reach all of those in this generation for Christ. We are in the world, and we're not to be of it. I'm not saying be of it. But it's really hard to reach people for Christ when you cause separation, when you want to just completely separate yourself, never talk to them and tell them how horrible they are all the time and things like that. You know, I've heard of testimonies where, where families, religious families, will just rebuke anybody that doesn't believe the way they are. They won't ever talk to them. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do, if you create that kind of separation, how are you going to reach them? You don't have to compromise. They, they know that. Now, sometimes they cause the separation, right? Friends and family, loved ones. They won't have anything to do with you because they know where you stand. But I would just challenge us in these days how important it is. The rapture, I believe, could happen in any moment. I don't want to leave anybody behind that I love and care about, let alone I don't want to leave my enemy behind. Do you understand? And so remember this. I, I don't know. God just put that on my heart. Just remember this. Stand for truth. Don't compromise. But try to reach them. And don't just, you know, throw them aside and say, I'm never doing, uh, talking to them again. Just try to reach them if you can. Because in the days we live, I think it's important. But according to these men from Jerusalem, they were telling them that they have to be Jews first. That's what their doctrine was. And that, that you had to live under the law. So every man had to be circumcised and you still had to live under the law. You had to become a Jew first before you could become a Christian. And so what is, what is Paul saying? He says, we were doing all this before. Before they showed up. So are we sinners? Have we fallen back? Does this make Christ a minister of sin because we're sinners? Verse 18 and 19 again, he answers with an emphatic, certainly not. And then he says this, for if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. And this is what I want us to really grasp. Do you see that? He says, I, through the law, died to the law. The very law that I'm dead to is the very thing that killed me. The law brings death. The law killed you and I. Pastor Chuck used to use this example, and I want to use it because I love it. Let's say a man is convicted of murder, and he's given a life sentence in prison. He's given the death penalty. Okay? He's found guilty. They pick him up in the prison bus, and they're taking him to prison. But guess what happens? He dies of a heart attack on the way to prison. Well, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Are they still going to lock him up? Are they still going to give him the lethal injection? No. Why? Because he's dead. The law has no more power over him. He's dead. Do you understand that's what's being said for us? The law condemned us. The law killed us. We're dead. But this is what I love. I love this. But we live through God. You see, the law killed us. It's the very thing that condemned us. It's the very thing that killed us. We're no longer under the power of the law. Verse 20, Paul adds this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Paul proclaimed the moment we die is the moment we live. The law killed us. We're dead to the law. It has no power over a dead man. Do you understand? We were rescued on the way to prison. We had no future. We had no hope. The law killed us. It condemned us. But we were made alive in Christ. And this is the thing. This is the thing that people struggle with in their relationship with the Lord. What you don't realize is you can do nothing to save yourself. And maybe you do. But also, you can do nothing. God loves you right now as much as he ever will. And he can't love you any less. God says, draw close to me and I'll draw close to you. It's just a relationship that he wants. He wants you to live your life in grace, not legalism. Legalism says, God, you owe me. God is a debtor to no man. Legalism says, you know what? I'm doing all these good works. God, reward me. Lord, I I messed up this week, but I'm going to do three good deeds. I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to say these prayers. And it's a miserable existence. But when you realize it's grace and you have your relationship with God based in grace, where you draw close to him and you build a relationship with him, it will empower you in ways you don't fully uh, recognize or understand. When you're no longer on that treadmill trying to please him, when all he wants is you to sit at his feet, get to know him, live in grace. You know, some who say, well, that's dangerous. You can't teach people that. If you teach people it's all by grace and they don't have to do anything, there's no law they have to follow, they'll just go out and become reckless sinners. <laughs> I think, well, we're all reckless sinners anyway. But Paul addressed that too in Romans 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. He said this, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ, who was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If you're truly a Christian, how can you enjoy living in sin? If you're truly a Christian and you understand what grace really is, you don't want to cheapen it. You don't want to live a life of cheap grace. You don't want to disappoint your father, the one who saved you from hell. You want to please him. And it's no longer, hey, I'm checking the box. I'm going to church. I'm getting, you know, kudos from the Lord. I'm earning some reward. It's no, I'm drawing close to my Lord, to my king, to my savior. I'm getting to know him. I'm building a relationship. And the closer you get to him, trust me, the uglier sin gets. You know that. And the less you want to sin and the more you want to please him. That's the power of the Christian life. And this is why the enemy intercedes with legalism, telling people, you can't live by grace. You can't just tell people they can live by grace. They need rules. They need laws. We're dead to the law. He loves you right now more than he'll ever love you because it's impossible. He loves you to the nth degree, and he'll never love you less. He's proud of you. He loves you. He just wants a closer relationship. That's it. That's it. You're not going to earn his favor. You're not going to earn all these rewards. He's a debtor to no man. I did 10 good deeds this week. Lord, you owe me 10, you know, righteous gifts. No. And Paul ends this rebuke to Peter and the rest of them by explaining that grace is the key. Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Every time we try to earn it, every time we get back on that treadmill and our performance-based Christianity, that's what we're saying. We're saying that Christ died in vain. Might might sound a little extreme, but test it. He loves you with an everlasting love. You're his child. You're, You're going to heaven. Do you understand? You can never be more holy than you are now because it's Christ's holiness. It's Christ's righteousness. It's Christ who lives in you. Your body is dead because of sin, but your spirit's in life because of righteousness. Christ lives in you, the hope of glory. When he he looks upon you, he sees his only son. I pray that all of us would embrace this, would really grasp who we are in Christ. Because I think it's a powerful thing. And Paul proclaims that he's not setting aside the grace of God. And Paul's reliving this uncomfortable moment in this letter to the Galatians because he knows it's going to help them because they're dealing with the same issue. They're dealing with the same issue. And maybe today you're one who's caught up in the performance-based Christianity. 
Maybe you're constantly beating yourself up. Maybe you're constantly talking horrible about yourself. I just keep failing. I'm miserable. God, how do you even love me? You know, you just go through that cycle where you fall, you sin, you have trouble, you have an issue, you beat yourself up and you think, Lord, why do you even, I I don't even know if I'm saved. All that's a lie from the enemy. Do you understand? He wants to keep you from being, getting closer to the Lord. He wants to stifle your testimony. That's what the enemy's doing when he's trying to put those things in your head. He will never love you more. He can never love you less. You are completely justified in Christ. And you know, today I found this list online and I've added to it. Um, I'll put it on the screen in a second. Uh, Just hold off on it. Um, But I want to read this list to you because this is what happens when you and I become saved. When we're born again, when Christ puts his spirit inside of us. There's a list of things that God says about you and me that I want to remind you today, to empower you today, to build that relationship with Christ, to build that relationship with the Lord through grace, not through your works, because I want to show you who you are in Christ. This is not an extensive list. This is just some of the things I collected. I want you to listen to this list. This is what God calls you, believer. You are born again. You are a new creation. You are accepted by God. You possess eternal life. You are reconciled to God. You are at peace with God. You are justified by faith. You're a citizen of heaven. You're a co-heir with Christ. You have passed from death to life. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. You're forgiven of every sin. You are adopted into the family of God. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You received righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. You are a friend of God and no longer his enemy. You have an inheritance waiting for you in heaven. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. You are royalty. You are cherished above all creation. You're the salt of the earth. You're redeemed. You're an overcomer. You're a king and a priest. You're saved. You are sanctified. You're justified. And you are a child of God. And that's just some of what the Lord thinks about you. Get off the treadmill. And not only that, though, I want to challenge you. Stop straddling the fence. Christian, live for the Lord. We don't have a lot of time left. Live for him. Live for your king and know that he loves you. And that he has redeemed you and he receives you exactly where you're at. Build that relationship with him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for the truth of your word, Lord, and that we are redeemed, and that we are children of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you for what you've done for us and continue to do for us, Lord. Thank you for your word. We praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.